Most oh, heavenly and gracious Father, we come to you today as humble servants to your word and to your will. We thank you for today. We thank you for being our God. We thank you for the many blessings in which you have given us in our days, in our lives, and in, in our families. We thank you for the health, happiness, and harmony that you have given us. Most of all, we thank you for our salvation through Christ Jesus. Lord, we also would like to thank you for the times of trouble and times of pain that we experience. As they help us grow closer to you, as they humble us, as they teach us those valuable moral lessons in life. And which you bring forth to glorify your will to us. Please use us as living sacrifices to build your kingdom. Bless us to your glory, and may our actions be pleasing in your eyes. Lord, personally, I ask that you use my lips to spread your word, to bring your message, to open the hearts and minds of those who wish to love you, know you, and grow too closer to you. Lord, we ask that you be with us, guide, guard, and provide for us as we know you always do. And in Jesus' most precious and holy name, we pray and we're thankful. Amen. Amen. I thank God for pain sometimes. Folks might think that's a little strange. We tend to thank God for the good things, ask Him to help us through the bad things. And uh, one of my very dear friends is blind. But he plays piano like there's no tomorrow. And he is able to inspire people by the hundreds playing gospel songs and singing songs of praise. He gets up and speaks and preaches. It's amazing to see how he can overcome that adversity to find joy in the world. And I walked up and I asked him one day, I, I'm not going to say his name, but I, I said, buddy, have you ever thanked God for making you blind? And he tilted his head in my direction and he said, no, I never really have. I wasn't sure how he would receive that question. Because many see blindness, of course, as a handicap and as a, a struggle or something that's bad. But I cannot help but see the immense good that he was doing. And the, the fact that God was using his weakness as a strength to glorify him, to glorify God through others. Do I know if you ever went and thanked him for it? No, I don't. But it's something that's been in my mind. I try to have joy in pain. Now, I don't like pain. You know, I'm not sadistic or anything like that. But I'm old. Getting older. I'm not a spring chicken anymore. My kids are running me ragged. My job is beating me up. And I wake up sore. But I push on. And I realize that no matter what I'm going through, that God is with me. I will gain in a new way the presence of Jesus if I can see the good in the bad. I cling to his promises and I realize that my pain is to make me stronger spiritually and to make my faith real. Because really, when do we go to God and humble ourselves completely is when we are in absolute agony. Much of my faith and testimony is a result of the pain and the suffering and the struggles that I've been through in my life and the results of seeing God act upon my life and to make things for my better. I put my trust in Him. So, last time I was here, I did a demonstration with water and, and vinegar and, and coffee and all those drinks and stuff, and it didn't have a glass. And so I'm going to ask you a very simple philosophical question. You don't have to answer it. But is your glass half full or half empty? Are you optimistic or pessimistic about life? Now, I was a smart aleck in school, and our physics teacher asked us this one day. So is it half full or half empty? And I raised my hand. He called on me, and I said, actually, it's completely full. And he says, no, it's not. It's half full of water. It's either <coughs> half full or half empty. I said, no, it's full. It's full of air, and it's full of water. You really have an argument with that. He said, you're right. So in life, have you ever been like, I'm not going to amount to anything. I'm never going to be anything or do anything or go anywhere. Have you ever spoken words of defeat to yourself? Like, I'm so stupid. I'm never going to get through this. I can't do this. I'm useless. 
It's pointless. I'm voiceless. I have no choices. I'm wasting your time. I don't fit in. I can't win and then sin. It's like that. I'm too big. I'm too small. I'm worthless. I'm hopeless. I'm ugly. Nobody loves me. I'm nothing. I don't do enough. I'm not good enough. I'm too weak. I'm too slow. I'm so low. I don't know. I'm too scared. I don't compare. Life ain't fair. No one's there for me. I'm all alone. No one cares for me. I feel disowned. God is nowhere for me. I love you. I love you too. <laughs> I'm a divorcee, a poor old lee, a screw up. I've been abused. I'm a cheater, deceiver, backsliding believer. I've been abused. I'm a sellout, dropout, cop out, over dramatic addict, outcast. I've had it. I can't stand it. I'm too damaged. Some people even say, I'm done. I quit. I'm so depraved. My life is ruined. I feel enslaved. My life is over. I can't be saved. These are all lies that we tell ourselves. It's all wrong. That is Satan whispering in your ear. None of that is you. All of it is wrong. That is not who you are. Jesus Christ is the breath of life and the waters of living food, fountains of living water. So is your cup half empty or half full? Or is that void filled with Jesus? Our souls were dead, but he is our sustainer, our redeemer. So therefore we are made alive. We're alive. Your glass is always full. And if you want to get real technical, as believers, it is overflowing with the grace of God. The first chapter of James, verses 2 and 4, is a very common verse a lot of folks like to throw out to somebody when they're going through some times of struggle. Somebody gave it to me, and yes, I'm rather cynical. And after they told me this, I said, yeah, it sounds easy. How do you find joy in pain? But... James 1, 2, and 4 says, Count it all for joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Again, sounds easy. I personally experienced this. I had a, a medical condition, a big, long, fancy term called iliococcal intussusception. It's just a fancy doctor term that means my intestines literally got tied into a knot. And they were prepping me for, 11, uh, for emergency surgery, and I was called NPO for 11 days, and that's Latin for nothing by mouth. No ice chips, no water, no candy. Nothing was to pass my lips. They gave me a saline drip to make sure I stayed hydrated, but I couldn't even break down IV proteins. My body was shutting down. I was going to die. God used that moment of my weakness, my sickness and disease to show me the path that he had for me. Because up until that point, I went on my own path. I believed in God, but I did everything my way. It fell flat on my face in those times. But it, there I was shown not only how many people loved me, how many people cared for me, but I had a chance to witness to so many people. And I've always loved talking about God. It's just who I am. You want to know something about me? I got to tell you about Jesus. My first few days in the hospital, my roommate was an atheist. He made fun of me. I said grace over my, my liquid food the first day I was there. I don't recommend it. Um, and he made fun of me. But for those three days that we were in the hospital together, we talked, we debated. And at the end of the third day when he was getting discharged, he asked me to pray with him. Small man. Now, do I know if you have got converted and baptized and all the other, etc.? I don't. But I saw that God used me to plant a seed. And I also got to see it sprout before he left. Huh? It took hindsight to actually see all this. I was still blind to it as I was doing it. <laughs> but that's actually how I decided I wanted to get into the ministry. Countless people came into the room after hearing us talking. They were preachers. Are you a preacher? You should be. Are you a preacher? And then without any prompting and without 
Uh, well, let me take a step back. God miraculously healed me when I was in the hospital. I mean, my wife is a witness. Uh, we, for lack of a better term, literally, literally watched the disease get healed out of my body. And then the doctor came in and said, we have no idea how to explain this to you, but your body healed itself. And I said, I, I know exactly what happened. And here I am to stand before you and proclaim his glory. I had no choice sitting in the hospital with no food for 11 days but to wait on God. The doctors are running around scratching their heads saying they don't know what to do. There's no medical literature for this. As someone my age, it should only happen to infants or very elderly cancer patients, which did make me feel too good about my own people. But they had no clue. The only one that knew what was going on and the only one that was directing what was going on and walking me through that very bumpy and rough, painful, agonizingly painful path was God. I opened up my ears while I was in there and I heard what he wanted. And I humbled myself and I said, okay, Lord, my path has been leading me down a dark and dusty road path that I don't hardly want to be on. So I'll follow you. You don't have to kill me. I get it. So, for some scripture to look towards how we should handle struggle, this is where I'll turn to the book of Habakkuk. Uh, very first chapter, verses 2 and 3. If you'd like to follow along with me, feel free. But Habakkuk, uh, the prophet says, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity, and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me, strife and contention arise. In other words, how long, Lord, do you want me to look out here and see this? There's violence, there's strife, there's contention, there's misery, there's suffering. Where are you, God? Why are you letting this happen? Well, God gives a response in verse 5. He tells him back, you know, come back at Look among the nations and see, and be astounded, for I am going to work in those in your days that you would not believe, even if you were told. That's not only the response that he was desiring to hear, so he ends up questioning God again. What is it that causes you to question God? We all have something. Is it maybe the death of a loved one? Has it caused you to wonder why God would allow such an incredible person to die? Maybe you've seen the suffering of a friend or family member and cannot shake those questions of why out of your mind. Why, God, did you not just heal them? Maybe you're going through an intensely personal struggle of your own and you're asking questions uh, like... Lord, why is my son in slavery to drinking me drugs despite being raised in a godly home? Why am I struggling with this addiction? I do my best to give it to you, but it, it keeps getting the best of me. How long, Lord, will you remain silent while I lose my job, losing my home, and I cannot provide for my family? These are all honest questions. And it's okay to bring them to God in prayer. That's the best thing to do. He's not going to be defended. He's not going to be insulted. Don't blame him for life. Satan is a devious liar. He makes bad things happen. God allows it because he wants you to grow closer to him and to handle those with grace. You were created to live outside of your comfort zone. Because we can lean on Him. And with Him, all things are possible. Chapter 2 of Habakkuk, verse 1, Habakkuk tells, or says, I will make my stand at the watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what He will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. Habakkuk knew that the solution to his confusion and his complaints could only come from God. So he waits. So let's remember that. Like the back of you must stand upon the watchtower, high above the clouds of the earth and way beyond the thoughts of men, where we can quietly wait upon the Lord until he responds. 
That's what Habakkuk did. God gave him a response too. In verse 4, he says, Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous will live by his faith. Did you hear that? The righteous person isn't someone who tries to make good with God by doing good works or by keeping to a set of rules. The righteous person is the sinner who has been declared righteous by God because of your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. That is the only way a person can be declared righteous. By God. Christianity is the only faith where you can't earn your way into heaven. It's a free gift. Based on your faith and your trust in Him. There is no other way. Habakkuk knew the difficult times were going to be coming to the people of Judah. And he understood that their only resource was to wait on God. To wait on Him in faith. To trust His word. And to rest upon His will. I don't know the amount of pain or the anguish that any of you have come here with. But I do know that your only and best resource is to bring it to God. To wait on Him. To trust in His word. In verse 14, jump down a little bit, Habakkuk gives God praise and he says, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters covers the sea. So this shows that God has a bigger plan for the earth than the suffering that they currently go through. Which means that God has a greater plan for you than the pain or the hurt or the sadness that you might be experiencing. There will be a time when God will once and for all destroy all evil and wipe away every tear from our eyes. No more pain, no more strife. If you're a believer in baptized in Christ, you do not only have to have this promise in complete glory, then, when we die, but you have frontline access to that glory right now. Because of Christ. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says, For God who said, Let the light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. In other words, you become filled with God's glory when you trust in Jesus. It might be hard, but try to enjoy God's glory in this current circumstance that you might be in. And rest assured, that every difficult season in your life will one day be transformed into a complete and eternal glory. A glory so magnificent, so wonderful, that it's, I mean, I hate to say this, but it's beyond comprehension. We cannot wrap our feeble minds around how glorious our reward is. Habakkuk's circumstances hadn't changed when he was able to glorify God and knowing that the struggles were coming. What had changed was him. His questions didn't get answered all the way he might have hoped. He changed. His waiting on God transformed his worry into worship. Let me say that again. Habakkuk's waiting on God turned his worrying into worshiping. Verses 17 through 19 state, Though the fig tree should not blossom, and not the fruit on the vines, the produce of, produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off, cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the, deer, like the deer's, and he makes me tread on my high places. Basically, what he's saying there is, God, though everything around me is crumbling, the economy is tanked, though I'm experiencing and witnessing evil and suffering utterly around us in my entire life, I feel destroyed. Though I have nothing, I will worship you. Job, in all of his struggles, said, though he slay me, I will trust in the name of the Lord. Though I have nothing, because of my faith in you, I will trust you, praise you, and worship you. 
You are the God of my salvation and my strength. You alone are sufficient for every situation. Whatever trial or hardship you might be in, whatever suffering or pain you might experience, whatever your circumstances are, rejoice in God. He's with you. Holding your hand as you walk through the fire itself. The truest expression of our trust in God will always be worship. Just as you are. That's the most beautiful part of this all. You don't have to do anything for God to love you. Sinner and saint alike, He created us in His image. You don't have to do anything for Him to love you. The moment that you were born again, God Himself came to dwell within you. That moment. Not after seminary, not after learning a whole bunch of Bible verses, not after completing your Sunday school classes, not after you make a donation, confirmation, graduation, ordination, or receive a congregation donation. Not after getting better or getting it together. The moment you were born again, He came to dwell with you, just as you are. And I don't mean Sunday in church you. I mean, first thing in the morning, scraggly, stanky breath before he had your coffee you. He knows you, and he loves you, just as you are. You're his temple. His call, his chosen, his treasure, his pleasure, together forever, night. You are set aside from the world, set apart in the world, before the foundation of the world. Holy. To be forgiven. Made right and saved by Christ, and your path is paved by Christ. You are redeemed in his deeds as an ambassador for Christ and esteemed just as you are. This is who you are. You're his masterpiece, his handiwork, his workmanship, created in him in his image and created for his glory. Created to proclaim and exclaim the great name of Jesus. Just as you are. You've been sealed with the Holy Spirit and commissioned to make disciples, appointed to bear fruit and exposed to life's truth, ordained to preach, taught to teach, charged to love and free to live, saved from sin, blessed to give, sent to seek, called to speak, with the shy and soft call. Just as you are. You are confident. You are courageous. With Christ, you are a royal priesthood and a holy nation. You are more than a conqueror for him who loves you. You have authority through Christ, power, love, self-control, security through Christ, purity through Christ, and surety through Christ. You belong to a kingdom unshakable, a covenant unbreakable. You can do all things through Christ, the one who strengthens you in a relationship with, of love with the Lord. You have everything you need. There is no lack thereof. Peaceably, graciously, abundantly, joyfully, just as you are. No matter what you feel, no matter what you've done, do, don't do, or been through, no matter what you're taught or told, no matter what you go through, as long as you believe, you are a child of the Most High God. Think about that for a minute. Do you get that? Just as you are. The God Almighty, the Creator God and the one and only God of the universe and beyond, calls you personally by name. A child. Hey, Dad. Just as you are. Just as you are. The greatest title, the greatest label, the greatest name anyone could ever be called, Christian. For all who received him, who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Just as you are. That's who you are. Live like it. Open a lot of communication. You pray. There's no ritual. You don't have to get down on your knees and go, dear Lord. Talk to him. There's so many experiences in my life. I'm driving down the street. People around me probably think I'm crazy, but I'm talking to God. I ask for safe travel. Sometimes I ask for the lady, you know, if he can maybe get the person in front of me to speed up a little bit. He tells me I'm being selfish in those moments. 
I talk to them. And prayer is amazing. Some people just think it's all oh, okay, well, I have to do this, whatever. But I'm telling you now, prayer has power. My, my oldest son, he can attest to some of the power of prayer because he sees me. I have an open walk with God. People think I'm nuts, but that's fine. I don't care because I'm with Jesus. I ask for everything and anything. I mow the yard for our uh, my local congregation, the church there that we go to. And one day I'm out there mowing and I look across the hills and I see just black clouds. This huge storm is rolling in and I knew I was running out of time. <laughs> I didn't want to do it, get wet. Every all the mowing grass when it's wet is off. So I stopped the mower for a second. As my son was walking up to me, I guess you can ask me a question or whatever, but I started to pray. And I said, Heavenly Father, I thank you for being my God. And I, you know, give his prayer and I asked, Lord, if you can find me in your will, hold the rain off until I'm done. I really don't feel like doing this in, in the rain. But if it is in your will that it rains, then, then so be it. I said, My amen. My son came up and asked me something about the mower that he was using because he always comes and helps me. And as he was walking away, those clouds come over top of us and the thunder, thunder rolled. And then it started to downpour in the parking lot across the street. And my son went, wow, Dad, you can see a wall of water. Not one drop at the church wall. Not one. Simple. Call it a coincidence. But when it happens two, three, four hundred times in your life and you see it, it's no longer a coincidence to me. God hears our prayers. He answers them. Sometimes we don't get the answers we want. Sometimes the answers we get are miraculous and we all will be able to comprehend. It wasn't like we split the Red Sea, but the water literally fell in the lawyer's office next to the church. And the storm spread that direction. We finished the grass was completely dry and came home. Stop. Stop. Have faith in him. Trust in him, speak with him, because nothing is too big or too small. Even those closest to Christ in his days had doubt. It's okay. Peter sank because he had little faith, even though he started walking on the water with Christ. If you turn to John eleven. We hear the story of Lazarus, starting in verse 3 and following. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. He then has a, a short conversation with his disciples in the following verses. So if you're following along with me, jump down to verse 11. <coughs> After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, then he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest and sleep. So Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. Verse 17, now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Verse 21, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. That's just like when we say, Lord, if you would heal them, they'd still be here. If you had just taken it away, you wouldn't be going through this. If you had just answered my prayer, things would be a lot better. If you cared, you would have done something. If you were good, you wouldn't let this happen. If you loved me, you would have been there. Where were you? Why did you do this? How could you? In verse 32, Mary comes, falls at his feet, and says the same thing that her sister did. In verse 33 and 34, it says that when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? So they said to him, Lord, come and see. And then verse 35, very poetically says, Jesus wept. This is one of the most profound truths that we have in Scripture. And it's compacted into the shortest verse of the Bible. Jesus Wept. 
He wept with his people. He mourned for his people. He cried over his people. This is the Christ, the King, God incarnate, weeping. It's not a sign of weakness. It's not a portrayal of imperfection or incompletion. He's not crying because he's lacking or he has a need. It's compassion. Sympathy. He's related. He gets us. He's connected. Yet there are times in our life, especially during times of pain and suffering or death and loss, we look at him and say, you have no idea what I'm going through. You don't know what it's like. You don't even care. Think again. He knows pain. He knows suffering, loss, death. He understands. He experienced it firsthand. He's been through it all, lived through it all. Right now, he wants to take it all from you, personally. Because he cares. Because he is. Because he loves. There's not much that I can do to take away anyone's pain. Or to ease anyone's suffering. I can't replace your loss. I don't know the answer to why. I have no idea what it means of how. Or whatever situation you may be in. But I do know the truth about death. Truth is said in verse 38 through 44. Then Jesus deeply moved again came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Then Jesus rebukes her and says, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I always knew that you hear me, but I say this on account of the people around me, so that they may believe that you have sent me. When he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the man who was dead came out of the tomb, wrapped in linen, around his feet, in his face. Jesus then said to them, unbind him and let him go. He raised the man from the dead. Big. But he raised himself from the dead to prove to us our victory, and he promises to raise us up as well. This is our truth. This is our faith. This is the hope we have, the joy, the peace, the comfort we have, the assurance, the guarantee that we have. This is the life as believers, as followers, and as his children. We don't die. In Christ, we never die. We pass on to the next. We move on to our home. We live in His glory. But it's life everlasting. It's life eternal. In the presence of Almighty God Himself where everything is perfect. No pain. No tears. Everything is right and we'll be together forever. But there's only one way. Only one way because it's through Jesus. It's not through our own our own good works, our own good lives, and good luck, because there's no such thing. It's not something that we can either earn, achieve, or pay for. It's impossible. We all fall short. We've all missed the mark. We all sin. That's reality. But because of His love, because of His mercy, because of His compassion for you, because He is good, because He cares, and because He is just, we have that promise. God himself came down from heaven to earth in the flesh. Jesus Christ. He lived the required life for you. He died the required death for you. He paid the required price for you. And he was raised on the third day and is now offering you the free gift of eternal life. This is the gospel. Believe it. Repent of your sins. Be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Walk with Him. Talk with Him. Sing your songs of praise, but understand that He's there. Whether you're in your Sunday best or your Wednesday's worst. He's there when you're happy. He's there when you're sad. 
He's there when you want to bring that person by their neck. And he's also there when you want to scream his praises from the rooftops. Trust in Jesus. He is the way, the only way. Jesus himself said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Everyone who believes in me shall never die. Spiritually. This physical world is but a blip in eternity. We spend so much time worrying about the now, the what if. Think about eternity with God. Yeah, this is tough. Christ went through something pretty tough in his life too. I'm sure you know that. And he prayed for those who persecuted him. He found joy. Something many preachers won't say because it tends to be controversial. But if you read in Isaiah, it talks about this side, Isaiah 53. God took pleasure in destroying his son. Because he knew that that was the ultimate expression of love to his creation. And that we would be able to be with him forever. So you're now fading away like vapor of snow. It wasn't the cross that killed Christ. It wasn't the Jews. It wasn't the Romans. Christ, when he prayed at Gethsemane, was not asking to get away from the temporal struggle that he was going to go through. The cup that Christ asked God to remove from him, if it could be in his will, was the cup of the wrath of God. That's the price that he paid for us. We weren't saved because the Romans had a very nasty form of execution called crucifixion. Our Savior was not afraid of some nails. He wasn't afraid to be beat, mocked, spit on, and scoffed. He did that with pleasure. But he took upon his shoulders the wrath of God that is justly meant for us because we have fallen short. And then he ends his prayer with, not my will, but yours, Father. If it is in your will that I go through this, then he's going to go through it. Do you believe this? Think of your struggles and what you're going through now. Can you find where God can be glorified? I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow. You're in good hands. No matter where the story of a godly person's life begins, the most important moment in our life is when we become aware of the fact that I am deficient. I can't do this on my own. God created mankind with the ability to be summoned spiritually. And whenever we come into contact with the reality of the message of the cross, we become defenseless. Whenever mankind comes into the presence of Almighty God, our sin creates feebleness. We realize our nakedness, our weakness is brought front and center. Consciousness in the presence of God is entirely different from anything that we ever experience in ordinary life. That moment, our encounter with the Lord, is personal. Jesus describes this as our willingness to eat his flesh and drink his blood through communion. During that divine, that divine encounter, many realize God has chosen me right now. How can I glorify him? Somebody's mean to you? Maybe God wants to show them forgiveness. Bless you. Genesis 15.1, we, we find Abram afraid. The fear that uh, Abraham is experiencing is not a fear of retaliation against himself and his family, but it's a holy fear. Abraham realizes his helplessness and the fact that God has singled him out and asked him to participate in something much bigger than himself. And that puts him into awe. He's amazed. It's a personal encounter of God with such immensity that everything else shifts in position. Isaiah says, Woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips, and I am in the land of people of unclean lips. Isaiah is summoned spiritually. He's awakened with the full understanding of God's supernatural presence, and it causes him inside a feeling of awe. 
Isaiah is brought face to face with his own unworthiness as a sinner. Jesus said in John 6, 38, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And I have come here today not to do my will, but the will of whom I come in the name of. I come here today in the name of Jesus Christ. I come here to share among believers his word. Because God lets bad things happen to good people. What we do with it, how we handle it, how we can see him within it, determines how much our struggle is actually a struggle. How back it didn't change, it didn't the situation didn't change. He did. He looked at it in a different way. He waited on God. He trusted in God. We must be convinced within ourselves that we hear the voice of God within our hearts. Are you hearing from God today? Really? Is it barely audible? Is it just an echo of years past? Are you not even sure if it's the Lord anymore? tell you now, if you're not hearing the very distinguishable voice of God, it's not because he isn't speaking. He is. He talks to you and walks with you day in and day out. If you're not listening. Soften your heart. I'm told to do that quite often. Not only by my Lord, but sometimes my loving wife is that voice of reason. My advice, start with a simple prayer. You don't have to do it in front of everybody. This doesn't have to be cute. You don't have to make a scene of everyone. Just talk to him. Be your best friend. Talk to him like you would your father. Interesting fact. The Hebrew word Abba means father. But it's actually used in the context of a child looking up at their, their dad. Like when my daughter comes and sits in my lap and gives me those eyes and says, Daddy, can I have one of these kings? Or whatever. <coughs> Abba has that connotation of love and an admiration within it. When you hear back from God, admit your shortcomings. Ask God to help you. Respond to what He tells you. Believe that He is with you. And when you're sure that you've heard from God, help, consecrate yourself entirely to Him by repenting and being baptized for the remission of your sin. We are buried and risen in the waters just as he was buried and risen in the tomb. And Paul tells us that during baptism we actually come into contact with the blood of Christ. Just as when we take communion from the bread and the wine with fellow believers, that is his body and that is his blood. His church congregation, you individually, you are the body and temple of Christ. When you hear the words of Jesus as spoken in the Bible, be a mother. Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Live in agreement with his blood. In John 6, 54, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks of my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Are you hearing from God today? If you have not given your life to Christ, if you have not made that choice to dedicate your life to Him as Lord and Savior, please come forward. No matter where you're at, no matter what step of your faith, no matter where you are in your life, now is the time. No one has promised tomorrow. He is waiting for you to just say, okay, Lord, I'm not perfect. Walk with me. If you want to give your life to Christ, step forward. Don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid. If you would, please, uh, we will have a moment of prayer. If you would like to come up, my door is always open. Receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Father, thank you. Thank you for being our God. Thank you for the breath of my lungs. 
Thank you for the pain and the comfort. Thank you for my suffering and anguish that I may learn from you, grow closer to you. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Please help spread it across my heart that I might spread it to the world. To reach those that are lost and in darkness, to show them a little glimpse of your light. Use us, be with us, God, guard, and protect us. In Jesus' most holy and precious name, I thank you again, Lord. Amen. Thank you for having me.